very appreciative of that. So Palm Sunday signals the start of Holy Week, a time when the church reflects on the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection on Easter Sunday. It marks the day of the Jewish people celebrating Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem to observe Passover among them. And it marks their hope in God's promise of reestablishing his throne in Jerusalem, freeing them from outside rule and occupation of pagan empires. This is a day that God had told his people would come centuries before. As Jesus rode in on the colt, the people recognized that God was fulfilling his promise to redeem and restore his people, and they welcomed the son of David, the one who came in the name of the Lord. Throughout history, civilized civilizations have used parades to send off their warriors and to welcome them home. History.com, not that I'm promoting that channel, but I'm just saying you can have a good look at some of the videos, but shows examples of grand parades uniting the people together in a patriotic pride from the Roman Empire to the modern age. And these parades turn heads, they're huge. And now we're added with the fighter jets and the planes and all the different things, the parachuting soldiers who land on just a spot. Very cool. It's so impressive to watch. And it's a tribute to our military families. So I don't want to in any ways minimize that. It is a tribute. But unlike the shows of force and strength we see in these parades, Jesus' entry was not filled with soldiers and all the pomp. It was led by a single man with one purpose that went beyond borders and political ideologies, and straight to the heart of humanity's need for a savior. In ancient times, we talk about palm branches, and I'm so glad that we have them this morning. They symbolize goodness. They symbolize well-being, grandeur, steadfastness, and victory. They were often depicted on coins, as we saw, and important buildings. Palm branches were regarded as tokens of joy and triumph and were customarily used in festive occasions. And we'll see that throughout the Old Testament when you read some of the passages. Kings and conquerors were welcomed with palm branches being strewn before them and waved in the air like we did this morning. It is a celebration. Jesus entered the holy city with the same type of tribute. Palm branches and shouts of, of Hosanna, meaning save us, save us. The joys of Jesus' triumphal entry was short-lived, however. Likely some of the same people celebrating him on one day were those who called for his blood later in the week. But this too was in keeping with God's plan and his purpose. Remember Jesus entered as a king on a colt, but without an army and a territory. Kingdom come. The already not yet, we've discussed on many occasions. And this, this next excerpt may give you a reminder of the word from, of ironies from last week. I talked about ironies way too much, but it, it did kind of flash back a little this week as I was pre preparing. Good old Charles Spurgeon. 1891, March 22nd, Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon. And he said this, The marvel is this, that, like, that the like had not occurred before. For our Lord had healed many sick folk, and these and their friends must have been felt favorably towards him. He had fed thousands at a time with the bread of this light, and hosts had been cheered and comforted by his teaching. The common people heard him gladly and were ready to gather around him. Among an excitable people, it was a wonder that they had not long ago taken him by force and made him king. It was the Lord himself who had suppressed the popular enthusiasm. With great skill, he succeeded in bridling a dangerous fanaticism. That's important. He did not strive nor cry nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. And with such a cry and such a voice he had, the marvel was that he preserved quiet and kept the nation from revolt. Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s. The sermon's called Hosanna, if you ever want to look it up. And the purpose of bringing this to light is not to stir up politics or unrest, political viewpoints. I won't go there. Yet think about the unrest across the border right now and this coming Tuesday. And I'm not looking to place blame or pre present my political viewpoints. 
but I sure love the comparison. The Jesus example and the modern day example. Jesus kept the nation from revolt. And it seems that so many with influence in our countries all over the world push for unrest to show authority or simply make a point. And a point that often leads to horrible consequences. Those in power really are modern day kings, stirring up rhetoric from all sides. Attention, power, control. Jesus could have stirred up a massive rebellion if he chose, with a supernatural army. But his kingdom, his reign, was that of a peaceful king, looking at, concerned for, the spiritual hearts of all. And Spurgeon wrote those words in the 1800s, so applicable for today, in today's unrest. So what a comparison between the power plays of Jesus and the leaders of today. Spurgeon says that Jesus kept the nation from revolt. And that is amazing and something we don't want to miss when looking for the fine details during this Holy Week. No matter what or who is taking control of a country, Jesus provided the ultimate example of what kingship should look like and that his mission was love and grace. Our Jesus, our Savior, what a week ahead of him starting today that started on this Palm Sunday. We read throughout the Gospels that Christ waited on the Lord's specific timing to enter into Jerusalem. He knew his purpose wasn't to claim a kingship, but to lay down his life for humanity. He humbly set aside his rights, his authority, and his claims to power that we might have be elevated from death to life and become co-heirs with him and the kingdom of God. We'll see that all over Romans. So all four gospel writers take notice of this passage of Christ riding in, in triumph into Jerusalem five days before his death. The Passover was on the 14th day of the month, and this was the 10th, on which the day the law appointed that the sacrificial lamb should be taken, chosen, and set apart for that service. And on that day, Palm Sunday, the Christ, our Passover, who was to be sacrificed for us, was publicly shown. Was that an accident? I don't think so. No different than the, law, the lamb being shown prior to sacrifice. Jesus was right out there. Another thought on not missing out. Little things that can jump out when reading a passage we may have heard often. Where do appoint, appointed kings go? Uh, presidents, prime ministers, after their victory. Church? Not usually. When Christ came into Jerusalem, he did not go up to the court or the palace, though he came in as a king, but he went to the temple. For his kingdom is spiritual, and it's not of this world. It is in the holy things that he rules, in the temple of God that he exercises his authority. So consider the fulfillment of prophecy, and I love this. Sometimes we look at prophecies, prophecy, we think about the end times, what's going to happen out there, the exciting stuff that we, that we look forward to when kingdom does come, which is fine. But how can the naysayers not see the obvious fulfillment of prophecy fulfilled by the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? How can they not see that? The Old Testament comes alive when we read the New. When we consider the writings from years ago, prior, that were fulfilled, it's amazing. Remember the Torah was Jesus's only Bible. That's all he had. He didn't have all the Bibles we have. He read that just like we read our Holy Bible and its many translations. So we never forget Jesus's entry into Jerusalem was a triumph, yet resulted in some horrible events. Yet this is where God reconciled with his people. As we consider the enormity of the start of Holy Week, Make these palms serve as a reminder of God's promise of a second return. When he will gather his church from the four corners of the world and establish his kingdom on earth. That's exciting. And a favorite prophecy, Isaiah 11, 10 to 11. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and the islands of the Mediterranean. 
And that is one of my favorite prophecies, fulfilled, the ones that we should really know. It helps us to validate our Bible to those who struggle with authorship and whether it's truly a supernatural book written by man, fully inspired by God. Some 450 to 500 years ago, prior to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, the prophet, sorry, 450 years prior to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah had prophesied the event we now call Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. So think of what we read today, and 450 to 500 years, at the time of Christ, it was already written. And I pray that this empowers and helps to strengthen your faith. These are fulfilled prophecies, and that's amazing. The prophecy was fulfilled in every way, and it was indeed a time for rejoicing as Jerusalem welcomed their king. But unfortunately, the celebration was not to last. The crowds looked for a Messiah who would rescue them politically and free them nationally. But Jesus came to save them spiritually. As we journey with Jesus this holy week, may we really work to avoid the darts of the enemy who wish to distract, sidetrack, and take focus over the sacred time of year. The mission of Jesus, steeped in love for us, was coming to an end, but with brutal images. He knew what was coming. When we think of Palm Sunday, the humble entry of Jesus, where Hosanna was shouting, meaning save us, ended up with crucify. May we start our days as humbly as Jesus entered Jerusalem, May we celebrate the awesome truth that Jesus came once as a babe, but the next time as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May we set aside our own claims to temporal rights and privileges in order to step forward in obedience to God's call to repentance and partnership in building his eternal kingdom. We are on a journey together, and I pray that we can hold on to the vision of revival, of mission, and congregational love, that we tell others, show others, so they will say, I want what they have. And we can do that, church, and you do that, this church. You do it. God bless you. Holy Week has begun. Let's walk with our Lord this very short week. Reflect on all that will go on in his life over this Passover lamb, over our Passover lamb. What he was feeling, try to visualize it. All he did for us, every day, walk with him and think about how he was feeling, knowing what was coming on Friday. That can never get old, and it truly is made new every day for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you came in the most humble of ways, born as a babe and a major, marginalized, really. You worked hard as a carpenter and became a rabbi. Although you could have taken on the world, you chose to humbly enter Jerusalem as a king, the king of kings. You died in the most humbling, horrifying ways, taunted and abused. You suffered that you did it all because of your love for us. You followed through. You were focused on the Father even when you felt forsaken on the day we call Good Friday. We love you, Jesus, for all you have done. And may we continue to visualize Holy Week and pray for a deeper connection with you. We will rejoice Sunday morning knowing the stone's been rolled away. Death has been conquered. Help us to share your joy and the message of eternal life with as many as we can. The world is hurting and frightened. You are the answer to everything. Give us the courage and the words to share the gospel anywhere and everywhere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.